to be discussing Immanuel Kant's epistemology. Kant said that his reading of David Hume is what woke him from his dogmatic slumber. So in a very real way, you can see Kant's philosophy of epistemology as a direct response to the debates that have been going on as we've moved from rationalism to empiricism to David Hume's skepticism of possible knowledge. And now Kant, having read Hume and understood this debate, is going to give his response in this ongoing discussion. The main question for Kant is how is synthetic a priori knowledge possible? In order to understand his question, we really need to understand what synthetic a priori knowledge really means. Let's talk about synthetic first. Synthetic means that the predicate is not contained within the subject. This is as opposed to analytic knowledge, which is true solely by the meaning of its terms. So let's think of a few examples. If we were going to talk about synthetic knowledge, we might say all bachelors are taxpayers. How do we know that's true? Well, it's not true just by the meaning of the words. It may be the case that all bachelors pay taxes, but we can't know that strictly from the definition of the words used in that sentence. An analytic truth would be something that is true solely because of the meaning of its terms. So, for example, a triangle has three sides. A triangle, by definition, has three sides. So that would be analytic knowledge, true because of its definition. Now let's think about a priori knowledge. Just a note, uh, if you're just reading this word in the text, you may think it's the letter a priori, but a priori and a posteriori, as you'll see, are actually Latin phrases, and it's not pronounced as the letter a, that's not just our normal letter a, it's part of the whole phrase, a priori and a posteriori. Okay, a priori is something that can be known just by thinking. So, for example, the phrase, all bachelors are unmarried men, would be an example of a priori knowledge. A posteriori knowledge, on the other hand, is knowable only by experience. So we might say, some people are over six feet tall. That may be true, or it may not be true. We have to use our experience to determine whether or not that's true. This gives us four possible classifications for knowledge. We can have analytic a priori knowledge, which is number one. We can have synthetic a priori knowledge, which is number two. We can have analytic a posteriori knowledge, which is number three. Or we can have synthetic a posteriori knowledge, which is number four here. So what is it that we're looking at with Kant? Well, let's think back to our discussions about rationalists and empiricists first. Both rationalists and empiricists would agree that one and four are possible. We can have a priori analytic knowledge, and we can have synthetic a posteriori knowledge. Rationalists and empiricists also both agree that number three is not possible. We cannot have a posteriori analytic knowledge. This leaves us only with what Kant is interested in, which is number two, a priori synthetic knowledge. So what exactly would that type of knowledge be? Let us examine first Kant's claim that we can know things about the empirical world without basing this knowledge on experience. How can we know anything about the empirical world in this way? Very roughly, Kant's answer is something like this. Because we made the empirical world according to certain rules, we can know a priori those features of the world that we put there in the first place. So what's, what Kant is saying is that the rationalists are right in saying that we can know things in the world with certainty. But the empiricists are also right in saying that such knowledge cannot be limited merely to truths by definition, nor can it be provided by experience. Instead, we know about the world insofar as we experience it according to the unchanging and universally shared structure of the mind. So for Kant, all rational beings think of the world in terms of things like space, and time, and other categories such as cause and effect, think of David Hume there, as well as substance, unity, plurality, necessity, possibility, and reality. That is, whenever we think about anything, we have to think about it in certain ways. For example, 
we have to think about things as having cause and effect, or existing or not existing. This isn't because that's the way the world necessarily is, but rather it's because that's the way our minds order experience. Our minds are constructed in such a way that they automatically order our experience using these categories that I've just mentioned. So for Kant, there can be no knowledge without sensation, but sense data cannot alone provide knowledge either. Let's look at a couple analogies to see if we can get this to make more sense. Imagine that you find a picture in your grandmother's attic of a building with the title, The Sears Tower. You've never heard of The Sears Tower. Does this picture by itself prove that The Sears Tower actually exists? Does it give you enough evidence to know that The Sears Tower exists? Clearly it doesn't. This picture could be just a figment of the artist's imagination. And this would be a lot like one of Descartes' innate ideas. Just because we have a quote-unquote picture in our minds of what reality is like does not mean that reality conforms to that picture. Now, if you did know that this artist always paints from life and is a good painter, then maybe you would have sufficient evidence. And this would be like Descartes' claim that God is the author of ideas of our ideas and can always be trusted. However, his argument for the existence of God was not very good. So let's look at this another way. Now let's say that you go to Chicago, but don't look up to the skyline and actually see the Sears Tower yet. Go to the archives and find blueprints that have been used to build the actual Sears Tower in Chicago. So you have it in your hands, this blueprint titled Sears Tower. Now you are in a much better position to claim that this tower actually exists. Why? Because a blueprint is basically a set of rules for constructing a building. And so long as you know the rules have been used, you know the tower was built. This is a lot like Kant's understanding of knowledge. Our mind has a set of rules for how our experience must be constructed. And since reality is the sum total of what we can experience, we know that the rules must always apply to reality. One more, and I've used my alma mater, Mississippi State, here. Imagine that you take a friend who is utterly ignorant of sports to a football game, but you don't tell this person that football is a game. Your friend watches the first quarter of play and no doubt will notice that the same types of things happen over and over again. Right? There are huddles, then people get down, one team hikes the ball, there's a play, there's some time stoppage, it happens again. They're going to get a sense of these patterns emerging while the game is playing. There's also no doubt that based on this person's experience, they will come to expect that the second quarter, the same sorts of things will continue to happen. The question is, does your friend know that they will? Obviously not, and this was Hume's point. For all your friend knows, the players will come out and do a dance on the field, and actually it might look something like what happens during halftime. So we build up these expectations based on the experiences that we keep having. In the first quarter, we saw the same types of things happening again and again, and so we expect that they're going to happen in the second quarter. But do they have to? No, there's nothing requiring that the second quarter of football be anything like the first, especially if we don't know it's a game, as we mentioned. But if you do tell your friend that they're watching a game of football, this gives them some more information. Now your friend is in a much better epistemic position because they know that games have rules and that things seem to recur in these games. So if they know that the same sorts of events they've been observing are because of these rules, then they know that whenever the same game is played, the same sorts of events following from those rules will occur. This is a lot like Kant's understanding of the mind. The mind uses rules to put the experiences together. We can know that some of the regularities and recurrences are a product of these rules, and since experience will always play by the same rules, the same regularities and recurrences will always be observed in reality. We can be said to know things about the world, and not because we somehow step outside of our minds to compare what we experience with some reality that's outside of it, but rather because the world we know is always already organized according to certain fixed, innate pattern that is the mind. Knowledge is possible because it is about how things appear to us, not about how the things are in themselves. Reason gives us the structure or the form of what we know, and the senses provide the content. So in a way, Kant is trying to bridge the gap here between rationalism and empiricism. 
he would say that every event must have a cause cannot be proven by experience, but experience is impossible without it because it describes the way the mind must necessarily order its representations. While empiricists thought of the mind as a blank slate, Kant argues that the experience of the world as we have it is only possible if the mind involves the systematic structuring of its representations. This structuring is below the level or logically prior to the mental representations that the empiricists analyzed. So to sum up how we know the world, we have these innate structures of the mind, which is a little bit different than the innate knowledge that rationalists claim. But these structures are what interpret our sense experience. And without that sense experience, we wouldn't really have any ideas or knowledge. So the two have to work together the structure of the mind interpreting the input of the sense experiences. So does that make Kant a rationalist or empiricist? Well, technically, he is a rationalist, but as we've seen, it's a little bit different than the traditional rationalist would think of innate knowledge. I always ask you guys to try to think of possible objections to these theories. One of the possible problems with Kant's solution is that it means we will never know if our ideas about the world are true. It means that we have to redefine what reality is as that which we experience, rather than that which experience represents. We can never still, with Kant, have direct access to reality itself. We can only have it filtered through the structures of our mind in these categories like space and time and cause and effect. So it's still impossible to know reality itself through Kant's system of epistemology. Mm -hmm.